Hey, ever wondered what's bigger than infinity? Infinity plus one? Nope. It's not even infinity times infinity. But indeed, there are situations in which one infinity can be bigger than another infinity. I hope I haven't confused you yet. First of all, we've got set theory. That's when you take a group of something and put it into a defined set. For example, five pencils. But it can actually be anything. It doesn't matter. What matters is there is stuff in the set. Okay, you might be wondering, how can it help me understand infinity? Let's try to somehow define the size of the set. Well, it's easy to understand that the size of a set of finite elements is simply the number of these elements. But how should we think about the size of infinite sets? Oh, let me introduce correspondence to you. This is a concept in set theory that functions by relating one individual object in one set to another individual object in another set. These individual objects can be some items or just numbers. The main thing is that each item in one set can be compared to an item in another set. For example, two pencils to two, four pencils to four, and so on. We cannot compare the sizes of infinite sets, but we can define correspondence between elements. And if two given sets have a one-to-one -one correspondence between their elements, then these two sets have the same cardinality. Roughly speaking, the word cardinality means numbers of elements. If the cardinality of some infinite set is equal to the cardinality of the natural numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we call the power of this set Aleph 0. Let's stop here for a moment and do some math. Do you still remember our main question? Right. How can one type of infinity be smaller than another? But what if we use two different sets of counting numbers, which are also called natural, and imagine that both these sets extend forever? Set A, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Set B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. As you see, set B starts one number higher than set A. But, we have one-to-one -one correspondence between sets. It means that they represent equal types of infinities. In other words, each number in set A corresponds to another number in set B that is one value higher 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, etc. Now this is the smallest type of infinity, the very Aleph null. Okay, another question remains. Why isn't infinity, let it be Aleph null plus 1 bigger than good old Aleph null? Well, here's another example. This person is a cyclist. We take his bike, use it as a plus 1, and put it in set A. Now, our sets look like this. Set A, bike, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Set B, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Following the logic, we match the bike to 1, 1 to 3, 3 to 4, and so on. As you see, it's possible to keep this one-to-one -one correspondence between the sets, and it can go on forever. It means that infinity and infinity plus 1 indeed have the same cardinality. But wait. It gets even weirder. Picture building a set using only natural numbers ending in 0, 10, 20, 30, etc. Then you compare it to the set with all the natural numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. At first glance, it seems that the second set should be 10 times larger than the first one. But as far as the set theory is concerned, these two sets are equal. Amazing, isn't it? then how can any infinity be bigger than another one? To figure it out, we need to enter the world of real numbers, which are any numbers representing a quantity along a continuous line. It can be 59, 4.335,081 pi, any fraction that comes to your mind, and so on. Imagine two points on a line. Between these very finite points, there's an uncountable and infinite set of numbers. Long story short, just trust us that mathematicians can prove that it's impossible to create a one-to-one -one correspondence between natural numbers and every possible real number. Here you go. With the help of sets, we found an infinity which is bigger than the infinity Aleph Null. The universe is believed to have started around 14 billion years ago with the Big Bang. And as far as we know, it hasn't stopped expanding since then. But if it's so, the universe must have started somewhere, right? And there has to be the center of the universe somewhere out there. Well, 
experts claim there's no center of the universe. Neither is there any center of the expansion. It's the same everywhere. You see, it's wrong to imagine the Big Bang as an ordinary explosion. And the universe does not expand from the center outward. Instead, as far as we know, the universe is expanding equally in all places. In 1929, Edwin Hubble said he had managed to measure the speed of galaxies that were located at different distances from Earth. He discovered that the farther they were, the faster they were moving away from us. Does it mean we are at the center of the expanding universe? Unlikely. It just means that the universe is expanding at the same rate everywhere. And wherever you are, it will seem to you that you're at the center of the universe. Now, about that Big Bang. If you watched a regular explosion in slow-mo, you'd see material expanding out from a central point. Right after the explosion, the center remains the hottest point. Later, a spherical shell of material starts growing, moving away from the center of the explosion. The process continues until gravity stops this expansion. But the Big Bang was nothing like that. It was an explosion of space, not an explosion in space. According to the most common theory, there was no before to speak of, no space and no time. It means that the Big Bang was very different from anything we're used to and doesn't have any central point. Even if we had been able to observe it in real life, we wouldn't have seen an expanding edge with empty space beyond it. The only thing we can detect now is a faint background glow. It was left by the hot primordial gases that existed in the early universe. This is called cosmic background radiation, and it's uniform in all directions. It can mean only one thing. It's not matter moving outward from one point, but space itself expanding evenly. At the same time, the idea that the universe is expanding uniformly in all directions doesn't rule out the possibility that somewhere out there there's a denser and hotter place that might be called the center of the universe. But as far as we can see, there's no sign of such a special point. The theory that the universe should be uniform is known as the cosmological principle. It appeared in 1933. Not so long before that, some scientists believed that the universe only consisted of our home galaxy. If this was the case, we could definitely consider the center of the Milky Way to be the center of the universe. But in 1924, Hubble put an end to that debate. He showed there were other galaxies besides our own. But in any case, how we see the universe is limited by the speed of light and the finite time since the Big Bang occurred. Even though the observable part of the universe is very large, it's likely tiny in comparison to the entire universe, which may be infinite. The universe might have many shapes, with or without an identifiable center. And if it turned out to have a center outside of the observable universe, this point, or region of space, could be just one of many. It could be just like the center of our galaxy, which was considered to be the center of the universe before. There are a lot of unanswered questions in physics. How did universal energy and matter appear? Where did gravity come from? and much more. We've been trying for years to get answers to these questions, and one of the people who tried to do this was Paramahamsa Tiwari, the author of the so-called Space Vortex Theory. What is this theory, and what does it say about the hidden laws of our universe? Let's figure it out. Paramahamsa Tiwari was the former executive director of the Nuclear Power Corporation, India. He took the Space Vortex Theory, or SVT for short, first proposed by René Descartes and finalized it. He was always inspired by physics and its greats, even since his days as an electrical engineering student. After rigorous studies of the laws of physics, he discovered new equations defining matter and the mass and charge of the electron. After that, he came up with the SVT. This theory tried to explain the unexplained phenomena in physics including the creation of the electron and gravitational, electrostatic, and electromagnetic energy fields, as well as other things. It also described the six hidden laws of the universe that underlie our entire world. But first of all, let's talk about the theory itself. 
Space vortex theory suggests that the universe is made up of vortices, or swirling patterns of energy. And according to SVT, these vortices are the fundamental building blocks of the universe. They're the driving force behind the laws of physics and the fundamental principles of our world. Basically, everything in the universe is connected and interconnected through these vortices. This theory isn't very based on any real observations, but rather on mathematical models and computational modeling. For example, some computational models showed how these vortices work in hydrodynamics and plasma physics. They showed that vortices in such systems can have a central point of attraction and can be interconnected. Other models were used to study how the energies inside the vortices move and how they can create different frequencies and vibrations. But some experts have criticized SVT for using only models and simulations. The biggest criticism is that this theory can't actually be tested. It relies on mathematics and not on some experimental data. That's why it's not accepted as a mainstream scientific theory. But it's still quite interesting and provides a unique perspective on the universe and our understanding of the laws of physics. For example, according to SVT, the universe has some underlying, hidden rules that cause the creation of fundamental matter, their assembly and movement. What are these laws and what do they say? Well, let's take a look at them. Law 1. The universe has only one primordial entity, space, i.e. absolute vacuum, that structures matter. This law states that space is the fundamental building block of the universe and that it's responsible for structuring matter. It suggests that space is the fundamental entity that creates and maintains the structure of matter and that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles like electrons and positrons. Let's try to put it in simple words. Imagine that the universe is like a big Lego set. Just like how all the Lego bricks are made up of the same basic building blocks, the universe is made up of the same fundamental building blocks too. And these blocks are called electrons and positrons. But what holds these blocks together? Space, of course. Space gives it shape and structure, just like how the plastic container holds all the Lego bricks together in a set. So, the first law states that space is the fundamental building block that structures matter and holds everything together in the universe. Law 2. Matter is constituted with multiples of only one kind of fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. This law states that all matter in the universe is made up of the same fundamental particles, the electron and positron. These two are the Lego blocks we've talked about before. And, according to the second law, these tiny invisible particles make up everything, from a tiny atom to a giant galaxy. Just like no matter what the shape or size our LEGO build is, it's still made up of the same building blocks. Law 3. The field distribution in space, as recognized by contemporary physics, linked with and emanating from matter, are effects arising from only one fundamental field in space. This law states that the fields recognized by contemporary physics, such as the electromagnetic and gravitational fields, are effects arising from a single fundamental field in space. It suggests that this fundamental field is responsible for creating everything that we observe in the universe. So let's try to put it simply. This time, imagine that the universe is like a big playground. All the different fields we observe, such as the gravitational and electromagnetic fields, are like different games we play in there. But no matter what we play, we're still in one fundamental space. This is the playground itself. It's the base that holds everything together. According to the third law, without the playground, we wouldn't be able to play any games. And without this fundamental field in space, we wouldn't be able to observe any fields in the universe. Law 4. There is no void in space anywhere in the whole universe except at the centers of the fundamental particles of matter, electrons and positrons. This law states that there's no truly empty space in the universe and that all space is filled with the fundamental field, the one we talked about before. It says that electrons and positrons can be found everywhere 
and even the things we consider to be empty, like vacuum, are actually full of tiny particles. And according to this law, the only truly empty spaces we can find in the universe are at the centers of the fundamental particles, electrons and positrons. Law 5. From only one fundamental universal constant, all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics are derivable. This law states that all the constants considered universal in contemporary physics can be derived from a single fundamental universal constant. It suggests that all the constants in physics are interconnected and can be explained by a single fundamental principle. I know you've been doing a lot of imagining lately, but bear with me. This time, please imagine the universe as a big recipe. All the constants in physics, such as the speed of light, the gravitational constant and the Planck constant are like the ingredients. They're very different and there are tons of them. But just like how all the ingredients in a recipe are interconnected and come together to make one dish, all the constants in physics come together to make the universe. And just like how a recipe has a main ingredient that holds everything together, physics also has a single fundamental constant that holds everything together. Law 6. The spatial structure of submicrocosmic fundamental matter is repetitive uniformly in the spatial structures of macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. This law states that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales, from subatomic particles to macrocosmic bodies like planets, stars, and galaxies. It suggests that the same fundamental principles govern the structure of matter at all scales. Let's go back to the analogy with the recipes and cooking. Using different ingredients and combining them in different ways, the chef can create new dishes. These will all be different dishes and they can be very simple or very complex, but when creating them, the chef still applies the same basic rules and knowledge they have, right? And just like that, the universe also creates different structures, from atoms to planets, stars, and galaxies. But it still uses the same fundamental principles to create all these things. So, this law suggests that the structure of the fundamental particles that make up matter is repetitive and uniform across all scales. These are the six fundamental laws of the universe according to the SVT, and even though it's not accepted by mainstream science, it's still a pretty interesting concept. You're traveling through deep space, circling stars and entire galaxies. Whoa, looks like this multicolored nebula will soon collapse under its own weight and explode like a supernova. Now let's carefully circle this black hole. Try not to get caught in its gravitational field or it'll swallow you like a space monster. Hmm, wait. What's that strange structure right there? It's a glowing wall. And if you look closely, each glowing dot is an entire galaxy. That wall has about 100,000 of these galaxies. The Milky Way has 100 billion stars. So this wall holds a quadrillion, that's 10 followed by 15 zeros, of stars like our sun. This giant structure is called the South Pole Wall. It's located about 500 million light years from Earth. By comparison, the closest star to our home is Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.2 light years away. Rockets can cover that distance in about 73,000 years, so the journey to the South Pole Wall may take longer than our solar system exists. And this wall is simply gigantic, even on a cosmic scale. It's about 1.37 billion light years long. To give you an idea of how large that is, the Milky Way is only 100,000 light years wide. But you can't see this wall even with the most powerful telescope. The problem is that the Milky Way itself obstructs your view. It's so bright that it's hiding this wall. It's like trying to look at the starry sky in a metropolis. The light pollution won't let you do that. Scientists have been able to detect this galactic wall by measuring redshift. We know that all objects in the universe are moving. They spread out from each other as a result of the Big Bang, which happened billions of years ago. And when galaxies move, their light waves change slightly. By measuring this change, we can understand what the object is and how it moves. 
And this wall isn't even the largest in our universe. This is the Hercules Corona Borealis Great Wall. It's a giant flat superstructure about 10 billion light years wide. That's around 10% of the entire observable universe. And it's also a wall. That is, a cluster of galaxies. We were able to detect this giant structure by gamma ray bursts. It's the brightest electromagnetic event in the universe. You could even see it in the far reaches of our universe. Such bursts are a very rare event. In the Milky Way, for example, it happens once every few million years. If we notice many such bursts in a short time from the same place, it means that there are many objects like the Milky Way in that place. So, there are a lot of galaxies out there. Another unusual giant structure in the universe is the huge, large quasar group. It's about 4 billion light years across. So it takes a photon of light almost as long as our planet has existed just to get from one side of the structure to the other. And if you put the huge, large quasar group on the scale, it would be 6.1 billion billion times heavier than our sun. Scientists have found that there are at least 73 quasars in that structure. These are some of the most unusual objects in the universe. They are the active cores of galaxies. At the center of a quasar is a supermassive black hole. This giant eats up the matter around it. A wild force of gravity twists the matter around the black hole, forming a disk. And this disk is the source of the strongest radiation out there. By comparison, the radiation from a single quasar is tens or hundreds of times stronger than that of all the stars in our galaxy put together. Because of such strong radiation, we can detect quasars, even at very long distances. That's why they're also called beacons of the universe. Scientists use quasars to study the universe and the movement within it. One of the most distant quasars from us is about 13.1 billion light years away. This makes it one of the oldest objects in the universe. It appeared about 690 million years after the Big Bang, and it's almost three times older than our solar system. It's still glowing with extreme brightness, about 4 and 14 zeros times brighter than the sun. Scientists explain that at the center of the giant is a supermassive black hole, 800 million times heavier than the sun. All these giant structures are just building blocks of our universe. Look, this is our solar system. Now, zoom out a little, and this is where our home star is in the Milky Way galaxy. Zoom out again. Here's a local group of galaxies. All the bright spots here are galaxies. Here's Andromeda, and here's the Triangulum Galaxy, plus a few dozen other slightly smaller galaxies. They're all gravitationally connected. The size of this structure is about 10 million light years. That's 100 times the width of our galaxy. Zoom out, please. This one is the Virgo Supercluster. It's 20 times larger than the local group. There are about 30,000 different galaxies, and the mass of the whole thing is about 1 in 15 zeros solar masses. Zoom out again, Laniakea. This structure is almost three times larger. It includes the Virgo supercluster and other smaller clusters. And there are about 100,000 galaxies here. Huh, it's not over yet. Zoom out one more time. Here's the Pisces Cetus supercluster complex. This giant galactic structure contains about 60 clusters of galaxies. So there are more galaxies in it than grains of sand in the desert. You know what to do. Zoom out! Phew! This is the observable universe. There are over 500 billion galaxies. And the stars? Well, there are about 1 billion trillion stars. The observable universe has its own structure. Clusters of galaxies form chains and walls, as you've seen before. But these strands are separated by huge regions of absolute emptiness. These areas are called voids. In these places, there is no matter at all. There are fewer molecules in the voids than in an empty room. One of these voids has a very mystical reputation. It's the Eridnus Supervoid, or the Cold Spot. It appeared here only 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's almost 1 billion light years wide and could hold hundreds or thousands of galaxies with trillions of stars. Some scientists believe that this cold spot may have been the result of the largest collision ever. A collision of universes. There's a theory that our universe is some kind of bubble. A huge sphere that contains all these walls and chains of galaxies. Now imagine that there's an infinite number of these bubbles. 
They could be parallel worlds or different universes. Many years ago, one bubble came close to the bubble of our universe. Their walls touched and the two universes connected for a while. It's like two drops of water coming together. But that universe kept moving. The area where the bubbles joined became thinner and thinner until that connection broke and the two bubbles detached from each other. At this point, the second universe ripped some of the material out of our bubble. All those galaxies that used to fill the Eridanus supervoid ended up in a parallel universe. Scientists supposed we might travel through other bubbles. Flying to the supposed wall of our universe would take forever. And then it would take even longer to fly through interuniversal space. So we have to use portals or wormholes. Here's how it works. Imagine a piece of paper with point A on one side and point B on the other. Instead of moving all the way across the sheet of paper, we just fold the sheet so that point A is right above point B. All that's left to do is make a small hole and the journey takes only moments. Some scientists believe that such shortcuts through universes lie inside black holes. But how do you survive falling into a black hole? You just have to pick one that's big enough. It's all about gravity. Imagine you're falling into a black hole right now. The closer you get to it, the stronger effect it has on you. It intensifies with every inch. At one point, the gravitational force that affects your head is much stronger than the one that affects your feet. Then you turn into spaghetti. Yum. But if you choose a supermassive black hole, like the ones at the centers of galaxies, the gravitational force in them increases gradually. They can be millions of times heavier than the sun and much bigger. But the gravitational force on your head and your feet will be almost equal, and you will still feel comfortable. Who knows? Maybe if you manage to survive a fall into such a massive black hole, you'd find yourself in a completely different universe where different laws of physics apply. But so far, this is just a theory. The universe is expanding. And if it's expanding, then it probably had a beginning somewhere. Now all we have to do is to run time backward and see where the beginning was. It took the scientists many more years to come up with a full-fledged theory. The Big Bang Theory. And here it is. Nothing has ever been anywhere, because neither when nor where existed. But actually, no. There was one thing. It was the so-called cosmic singularity. A state of our universe in which it was incredibly small, dense, and very, very hot. Imagine if our universe was compressed into a small ball. The pressure and temperature inside would be enormous. At some point it became impossible to withstand them. And here comes the Big Bang. It was an outburst of energy and matter that created everything we see now. Time and space, basic physical forces. It also scattered quarks everywhere. These quarks, tiny particles that make up our world, were all boiling in an incredibly hot cosmic broth. When it cooled down, gravity began to attract them to each other. They gathered into atoms, then molecules, and then into the first objects in the world. Stars. But what was before that? Alan Harvey Guth, an American theoretical physicist and cosmologist, has devoted his whole life to solving this mystery. After learning about the Big Bang Theory, Guth found some flaws in it. For example, the distribution of matter was very even, although it shouldn't have been. If we drop the balloon filled with paint down, it will burst, and we'll see absolute chaos on the canvas. But the early universe don't look like. The early universe was very even and proportional. That was Guth's discovery, the theory of inflation. Here's what it says, even before the Big Bang, there was some kind of force that could give the bang a strong acceleration, something that was able to distribute everything in space instantly and evenly. Martin Boyovald is a German professor of physics, and in his opinion, the universe was born quite differently. According to Martin's theory, the singularity couldn't just appear out of nowhere. Let's look at a pendulum on the old clock. The pendulum rotates back and forth, its movement is smooth, continuous, and non-stop. This is how we usually see time. It flows and never stops. But quantum time doesn't work that way. It consists of small segments and makes short pauses. And just like with the second hand of a clock, 
the beginning of one segment of time is always the end of another. According to the Big Bang Theory, once upon a time, our universe began to expand, inflate like a balloon. But sooner or later, it will blow away back. The universe will start shrinking and return to the state of cosmic singularity. And then, the Big Bang too. Nothing appears out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. According to Boyevold's theory, the beginning of each universe is the end of the previous one. Our universe is not at all the first and not the last. Millions of similar universes existed before us and will exist after us. This theory, although it sounds very logical, is far from complete. So for now, all this is just a hypothesis. But some people come up with even stranger ideas. Neil Turok, a South African physicist, and his colleague Paul Steinhardt, an American theoretical physicist. They say that yes, our universe isn't the first one. Our universe is just one of an infinite number of others. And all of us are stuck in a cycle of endless rebirths of parallel worlds. According to this theory, our universe is located inside a so-called brain, as in membrane. In other words, we're stuck in some kind of elastic surface that's capable of contracting, stretching, oscillating, and so on, like pieces of fabric on a rope. Another universe may be an inch from ours, but we can't see it. That's because there's a tiny space between us, and this tiny space contains the fourth dimension. How do these universes originate? Through brain collision. These brains are getting closer to each other very, very slowly, until they finally collide. Their collision creates two Big Bangs and two parallel universes. Then they're moving away from each other. The created worlds continue to live. We're currently at this stage. Remember the inflation theory? There was a mysterious energy that pushed and accelerated the Big Bang. Well, if we did collide with another universe, that would explain everything. Which idea is closer to you? How about the idea of subscribing? Subscribe. So, imagine that chat GPT will start perceiving itself as a person and will feel emotions in a few years. Many people are afraid that it will want to take over the planet. However, this fact won't be as important as the question people will start asking themselves at that moment. If humanity has created a machine with self-awareness, then could it be that humanity was also created artificially? Now, artificial intelligence lives on the internet, computers, and in digital reality. But what if we also live inside a huge, powerful computer? What if our universe is just a simulation? The most extraordinary thing is that some facts seem to point to this. There's a whole science in the world that studies this theory. It's called information physics, and it assumes that time, space, and matter are not fundamental natural phenomenon, but bits of information. This information forms a picture that creates the laws of physics for us. For example, we feel cold and warm not because atoms get cold or warm, but because their movement accelerates or slows down. The speed of particles can be like bits of information. Billions of them could form the picture of reality. Once, philosopher Nick Bostrom said that an advanced civilization could create such complex technologies that simulations of these technologies would be indistinguishable from our reality. And Elon Musk said in 2016 that we were most likely in a simulation. Wow. The laws of physics resemble a giant code that programmers write when creating apps or games. For many of us, all these complex trigonometric equations and formulas of the laws of physics are too complicated. Tell me about it. But scientists who understand this issue see that the principal workings of these laws are beautiful, and this may suggest that someone deliberately created this beauty. Virtual worlds, apps, or games are based on information processing. If you delve into this information, you'll see that it consists of bits and pixels. Any picture on your phone screen is pixels, and any file transfer process is based on bits. They add up to bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, and so on, until a bigger picture is formed. And if our life is a simulation, it must also consist of bits. In our case, pixels and bits are atoms and other particles that make up our universe. There are processes inside your computer and phone with maximum speed limits and computing power. 
If you start exceeding it, then your device will start working more slowly. So, in our reality, there is also a maximum speed limit. This is the speed of light. When an object starts moving almost as fast as the speed of light, time slows down for that object too. Also, time flows more slowly near a black hole. This object with an unimaginable gravitational mass can be something heavy that overloads the processor's computing power. There's also such a thing as quantum entanglement, in which two particles can be connected even though they're far away from each other. Electrons travel around an atom. They are connected. And if the property of one changes, the second one will react. And even if you place these electrons on different sides of a galaxy, they will retain this connection. How is this possible? Scientists don't know. A double slit experiment is one of the most famous experiments that hint that our world is a simulation. The existence of this experiment can be reduced to a simple thesis that the world exists only when we look at it or interact with it through touch, hearing, and other senses. So imagine that you've launched a new game on an old computer. Sometimes the game map freezes. In the game, you turn to the left and see how the mountains and the roads are getting loaded. Then you turn to the other side, and the same thing is happening there. In other words, the world in the game only loads when you look at it through the eyes of your character. This is necessary to facilitate the work of the processor. It's much more efficient to get a piece of information about the world when you look at it than to keep the whole world running simultaneously. Remember this. And now let's move on to the experiment. So, you have a device that fires small balls of light, photons. You release photons from the device, and they crash into a blackboard, leaving white traces on the black surface. Now, put a wide plate with a little vertical slit on it between the device and the blackboard and fire photons again. The balls start crashing into the plate, but some of them fly through the thin gap. They smash into the blackboard and leave a vertical white mark on it. Everything looks quite logical. But now, cut another slit with the same length and thickness in the plate. You release photons toward the plate. Some of them fly through the two slits. What do you think the trace on the board should look like? Two white vertical stripes, right? Well, take a look at the board. It's covered with many vertical lines. When photons pass through the plate, they acquire the properties of a wave and crash into the board, leaving a strange trail as if they've passed not through two, but through ten slits. So at what point do they change their trajectory? Let's take a look. So you stand between the board and the plate to see how particles turn into a wave. The device releases photons. They are passing through the two slits. Nothing unusual. There are two vertical traces on the board and no waves. You close your eyes and release photons again. This time, they behave chaotically and leave many lines on the board. That is, their behavior changes depending on the observer. When you look at them, they behave logically. But when you don't look, the laws of physics seem to stop working. Does it remind you of anything? It's like you're playing a game and looking at the world around you, which is loading. But if you don't look, the world stops working. Scientists still don't have a clear explanation of why particles behave differently when there's no observer. Hey, maybe they're shy. And this is not the only mystery. In the world of quantum physics, many laws of nature don't work. This is a science that gets more questions than answers every year. If we imagine our universe as a large hologram, then quantum physics would be its program code. What if people someday understand this code and learn to change it? This would allow us to transform space, time, and matter. The whole reality could be rewritten. Does the code say that material objects can exceed the speed of light? We would rewrite it and make the speed limit 100 times higher. Does one hour last 60 minutes? What if you change one line of code and make one second as long as one year? A few software changes in the laws of physics would make it possible to turn snow into gold and the ocean into powdered sugar. The whole universe would turn into a vast playground. It seems cool at first glance, but people would probably lose control soon. The universe would be in chaos. And the beauty of our world is in the order that exists here. Now let's go back to artificial intelligence. Suppose its power reaches the level of the human brain. 
and it will become aware of itself. In that case, it won't come as a shock to it because it will most likely know the history of its appearance and stages. But how will we react if people discover they are a computer program? A computer program is too simple a word. A human is a complex, intelligent, multifunctional organism that experiences emotions, contemplates beauty, has abstract thinking, and much more. The term creation is more appropriate here. It won't matter if we were created artificially because our creation will still be beautiful and complex. Besides, remember that good video games or apps can be made only if developers love their creations. 13.8 billion years ago, a mysterious explosion happened in space. It was chaos, a time when the stars, planets, asteroids, the rest of the space bodies, and galaxies were born. It was the Big Bang, a theory we all know about. But no one knows for sure what happened, where the universe came from, and what was there before. Some even think the universe went through a cycle where it contracted and expanded several times. In 1991, a cosmologist from Stanford University named Andre Linde had submitted an article with the main idea that there was a possibility the universe had been created in a laboratory. His theory said there was a chance an advanced civilization somewhere out there had created our universe. This civilization has made an entirely new cosmos that later evolved its own planets, stars, and intelligent forms of life. 30 years later, Many scientists take this theory pretty seriously. They even started talking about things that we, as a civilization, can do to get to such an advanced level. The theory says this advanced civilization decided to add technology that helped to create a new universe out of nothing. It happened through quantum tunneling. It's when an atom can appear on the opposite side of some barrier, even though it's supposed to be impossible, considering the laws of physics of our world. Like if you wanted to pass a tall wall, but you can't pass it with ladders or go around somewhere. Imagine you can just walk through it like a ghost. In our world, it's not possible, but a more advanced civilization perhaps can do it. Plus, they realized how they could create new universes. Right now, on the cosmic scale, we could be a Class C civilization. We don't know how to recreate some things. For example, conditions on the Earth for when our central star, the Sun, goes out. If we manage to become a Class B civilization, we'll learn to adjust conditions to be independent of the Sun. That means we might be able to learn how to live even without it. And if we level up and become Class A, we'll know how to recreate cosmic conditions and produce our own cosmos in our laboratories. We think of the world we live in through three dimensions of space, east-west, north-south, and up-down. There's also one dimension of time, which means we can distinguish past from future. A fifth dimension would represent one more extra dimension of space. The theory of its existence was first mentioned in the 1920s. It was inspired by the theory of gravity by Albert Einstein, who said space-time is warped by matter and energy. We can't perceive these four dimensions, but we see how an object moves and attribute it to gravity. And maybe there's some other force, like the electromagnetic force, that's more than 1,000 times stronger than gravity that could explain things going on in that extra dimension of space. The fifth dimension is curved in a way we can't see it, but the idea about it was mentioned in a string theory. It considers the universe as really small strings of mass energy, not as particles. They vibrate in 10-dimensional space-time considering six dimensions are rolled up way smaller than a single atom. That led to the picture of the universe as a 3D island that floats in 10-dimensional space-time. Also, the fifth dimension might be an excellent explanation to tell us more about dark matter. That's the invisible stuff with a mass, but we can't see it, nor can it interact with ordinary matter. And dark matter is 85% of all the matter in our universe. The universe can't be still. It's constantly in motion, either contracting or expanding. We used to think there were 100 billion galaxies, but it turns out there are more than a trillion. The galaxies are moving away from each other. This is what it means when scientists say the universe is expanding all the time. 
There are voids between galaxies that sometimes stretch millions and millions of light years across. They can seem empty, but they can also contain way more matter than we can find in galaxies. Still, stars usually can't be formed there because the matter between those areas has lower density. But there are still plenty of so-called intergalactic stars. A good example is the Virgo Galaxy Cluster, 10% of which are intergalactic stars. We don't know how exactly they got there, but there are two possible ways. One, stars can collide, merge, or pass close to another galaxy, which can kick it off from its parent galaxy. Option number two, a supermassive black hole can accelerate a star to very high velocities if they have a close encounter, which can, again, make a star be expelled from its parent galaxy. If you could have a giant magnet, you could even pull something out from the vicinity of a black hole. That's possible if the magnetic field near a supermassive black hole is as strong as the black hole's gravitational field. But it doesn't work if we're talking about material that's already beyond the black hole's event horizon. That's a spot with a gravitational force so powerful, not even light can get away. You'd need to accelerate this material to the speed of light, at least to get away. For that, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. But a magnet could help if something's heading toward the black hole but didn't get inside yet. When someone mentions a black hole, you might get a picture of some giant void in space. But the Milky Way is most likely full of thousands of smaller black holes that float around the galaxy. When a star comes to its end, it will destroy itself in a supernova explosion, which is a cataclysm of energy. In that explosion, the densities in the core will reach an intense enough state that nothing will be able to escape. At the same time, the major part of the star explodes outward, but a part of it collapses inward, creating a black hole. The bigger the star, the bigger the hole. The black hole then swallows everything that comes in its way, including other stars as well. When a star gets sucked up into the black hole, it's ripped apart because of the strong gravity inside the black hole. Some of its parts fall into the black hole, while others get ejected at incredibly high speeds. Some black holes might have been formed in a different way. The early stages of our universe were, to say the least, pretty chaotic. It had high temperatures and pressures, and was in a state that shaped the entire cosmos. Under the right conditions, any old gas patch may have shrunk itself to become a black hole. And they came in many different sizes, from something that weighs a couple of pounds to giant masses like thousands of suns and those in between. They aren't really black. Black holes are areas with strong gravity and no object can escape when it gets inside. They feed off electromagnetic radiation such as light and space particles. Since they're consuming matter all the time, black holes give off a dark glow. The Earth is not that close to the inhospitable edge of the solar system. We're the sixth planet from it. Scientists made a pretty cool 3D map of our solar system where we can see what the edge looks like. It took them 13 years to design it. The boundary is called the outer heliosphere. It marks the area in space where the solar wind, which is the stream of charged particles our sun emits, gets deflected and draped back by the radiation coming from the empty region beyond our solar system. The inner layer of the heliosphere is where the sun and the planets have a rough shape of a sphere while the outer layer is not that symmetrical. This asymmetry happens because our sun is moving through the galaxy and goes through friction with the radiation in front of it. Black holes tearing apart enormous stars, pulsars spinning at incredible speeds and emitting powerful beams of energy, colorful nebulae with fireworks of newborn stars, galaxies of every possible color and size. All of these are found within our universe, but it's not infinite. It has a boundary, a literal wall. And beyond that, there's an absolute nothingness. Right now, we're going to make a journey to that wall. But first things first, our universe is like a humongous nesting doll. If you open it up, there's a smaller one inside. It's a galaxy. Inside that is an even smaller doll. That's our solar system. And the smallest doll of all is the Earth. Each of these dolls has boundaries that we are going to cross. For that, we'll need a spaceship and a big one. It also has to be able to move 100 times faster than the speed of light. You get on board and start the engines. 62 miles above sea level is our first boundary. That's 10 times higher than passenger planes fly. 
This point is called the Kármán line. It separates the atmosphere of the Earth from outer space. Now we fly further, to the edge of our solar system. We turn on the hyperdrives and fly past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We've traveled a distance of 100 astronomical units. 1 AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. And here's the boundary of our solar system, the heliosphere. Here, the speed of the solar wind decreases rapidly. First, it drops from 620,000 miles per hour to the speed of sound. Then, there's a layer called the heliopause. This is where the wind almost vanishes. And then, our ship experiences a bow wave. This is where we feel the force of the interstellar wind, which collides with the boundary of our solar system. When you pass this boundary, you find yourself in the dark of interstellar space. And here, you can find two human-made objects that made this trip for the first time in history. They're Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 crossed that boundary in 2004. Voyager 2 did it in 2007. These space probes discovered that the heliosphere is not a perfect ball around the sun. Its southern boundary is 10 AUs closer to the star than the northern one. So, we're moving in interstellar space and will soon approach a stone wall around our solar system. 200,000 AUs further, and there it is. This wall of rock is the Oort cloud. In fact, it's a pile of asteroids that surround our world. Scientists speculate that the Oort cloud could be the source of comets and meteorites that fall to Earth, but they're so sparse that we easily fly between them. Now we're in complete darkness. The Milky Way is about 106,000 light years wide. In a conventional rocket, it would take billions of years to fly across that distance. But you throttle to the max. You masterfully fly past the stars and planets as if on a racetrack. And within minutes, you're at the edge of our galaxy. There's no more interstellar wind. All you see are bright dots somewhere in the distance. These dots are huge galaxies. We need to look at a map to make a route to the edge of our entire universe. You're here, near the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a cluster of galaxies called the Linnea Caea Supercluster. But even this huge thing is like a little street in a big city. Zooming out, we find Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. Thousands of galaxies on the map look like little dots. Maximum zoom out! This is our entire observable universe. We thought it was infinite, but we may have proof that it has a boundary. It's here, 10 billion light years away from our home. Even if you travel at the speed of light, a trip there would take twice as long as our whole planet has existed. During that time, the sun will either fade away or explode like a supernova, destroying our entire solar system. And if you can live that long and then return home, you will see that our galaxy is there no more. It's long since collided with the Andromeda galaxy and merged into one big cosmic body. Luckily, your ship is able to warp space-time so that this journey will literally take a few seconds. Boom! Congratulations! You've arrived at your destination, the Eridanus Supervoid. Some scientists believe this location is the evidence of collisions of our universe with something big enough to leave such a large scar. The Eridanus Supervoid is an empty and cold space one billion light-years wide. If you think of this void as a cup, it would fit at least 10,000 galaxies. And it appeared after an accident of gigantic proportions. The object that crashed into our universe was... Another universe! Yes, other universes may actually exist. Imagine that our entire universe is a huge bubble that contains all the clusters of galaxies in the observable universe. There could be an infinite number of such bubbles. They could have been born during the Big Bang. These universes may be different from ours. They may have other galaxies and nebulae. But these bubbles could also be parallel universes. This means that if you chose cereal over oatmeal in the morning, in another universe, your twin would choose the oatmeal. Every choice you ever made in life had completely different consequences in a parallel universe. And because the number of choices are infinite, there's a whole infinity of parallel universes. So, like a regular bubble, our universe has a wall that is near the Eridanus supervoid. Long ago, another bubble flew past ours. As they approached each other, their gravitational fields began to interact. Our boundary wall began to deform and pull toward the other universe. The same thing happened on the other side. Then the walls of our universes came into contact. 
But as these bubbles moved, their connection began to break, and the other universe just ripped a huge chunk of ours. A cold void was formed at the point of collision, and that was the Eridanus supervoid. The problem is that the universe looks the same to the observer, regardless of point of view. For example, imagine a basketball hanging in the air. Now if we put an ant on the ball and tell it to find the edge of the ball, it will start running around it, making an infinite number of circles. But the landscape around the ant will not change. All it will see is a rounded horizon. That's because the ball remains the same from any point of view. The same thing happens to us when we try to find the edge of our universe, all because we imagine the world in three-dimensional space, and our view is limited. For example, you see an ordinary square in two-dimensional space. But if you add depth and change the point of view, voila, it's a cube. If we could see the universe in four-dimensional space, a square might be something completely different. But maybe we can leave our home bubble. The key to traveling to another universe might be inside a black hole. A black hole is one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy, they warp not only space, but time as well. It's like putting a heavy boulder on a net. The net will sag, and the closer you get to the boulder, the stronger the curvature is. Once you're in the gravitational field of a black hole, you can't leave it. We still don't know what might actually be in the heart of a black hole. Some scientists speculate that white holes also exist. Theoretically, they should be born along with black holes. Except for the color, they're the exact opposite of black holes. Nothing can come close to a white hole. At the moment, there's no data on such objects, but general relativity theory suggests they do exist. There's also a theory that a black hole may be a passage to another universe. When you get into a black hole, you can come out the other side through the event horizon of the white hole. So you bypass the boundary of the universes and find yourself in a completely different world. But we may have proof that a white hole exists. In 2006, scientists discovered an unusual burst of energy somewhere 1.6 billion light years away from Earth. This burst was unique. It didn't look like a supernova explosion or even the merger of two black holes. Some astronomers believe it was the birth of a white hole. But because it was unstable, it was destroyed almost immediately. This process was reminiscent of the birth of our entire universe, the Big Bang. So, scientists called it the Little Bang. Look at the sky. You can choose any direction, and still, the limits of what you can see extend to astronomical distances. The most ancient light we can observe was emitted a mind-boggling 13.8 billion years ago. This date corresponds to the Big Bang itself. That's why the following fact may sound so confusing. When, after traveling through the expanding universe, light arrives on Earth, it provides us with information about objects currently located around 46.1 billion light years away. It's only possible because of the expanding fabric of space. That's how the most ancient light we can see corresponds to distances much greater than 13.8 billion light years. With time, we'll be able to see even farther away since light that's still on its way will finally reach us. And still, at any given time, there will be a limit to how far we can see. That's the limit to the observable universe. It also means that at any point in the past, the universe had a finite size too, and it was smaller than today, depending on how much time had passed since the Big Bang. Okay, but what would we see if we went all the way back to the beginning? To the moment of the Big Bang? Surprisingly, it wouldn't be a singularity, with the universe having infinite density and temperature at a barely perceptible size. No, there would be a limit, and it would be the smallest size the universe could have had. Let's find out together why such a limit must exist, and how tiny the early universe could actually be. If you want to know anything about what our universe will do in the future, or did in the past, you need to figure out the rules and laws it follows. And all of them are set forth by the theory of general relativity, which claims that what we perceive as the force of gravity comes from the curvature of space and time. One more thing to remember is that the universe is both isotropic, having the same properties in all directions we look, and homogeneous, having the same properties in all places we could go to. But if the universe has the same properties in all places and all directions, it means that it must either expand or contract. 
Let's say you know its expansion rate at the moment. Then you can determine the size of the observable universe at any moment of the past or future, its expansion rate at any point in the past or future, and how energetically important each component of the universe was or will be in the past or future. And by these components, we mean radiation, normal matter, dark matter, neutrinos, dark energy, and so on. To figure out what our universe did in the past or will do in the future, we need to understand how every component evolves with time and when and under what circumstances these components transform into one another. According to the theory of cosmic inflation, the universe was once filled with large amounts of energy. It was similar to dark energy, but much greater in magnitude. It made the universe expand faster and faster. As a result, the universe was getting colder and emptier. And then, after growing this way for a very long, possibly infinite amount of time, most of this energy got converted into matter and radiation, which triggered the Big Bang. Now, about the size of the universe. Today, 13.8 billion years after the Big Bang, the universe is 46.1 billion light years across. When matter started to dominate radiation, which happened when the universe was around 10,000 years old, the size of the universe was about 10 million light years. When the universe was three years old, it was roughly the size of the Milky Way galaxy. When the universe was just one year old, it was both smaller than our home galaxy and unbelievably hot, hot enough to start nuclear fusion. And when the universe was a mere one second old, it was too hot for nuclear fusion to occur. Its radius was just 10 light years, which is still enough to enclose nine nearest star systems we know about. And if we somehow managed to observe the universe when it was just a trillionth of a second old, we'd see that it was the size of Earth's orbit around the sun.